Hi, I am Pastor Dave, and this is my wife, Sarah. And we've been a part of High Point now for five years. And one of the many things that we love about High Point is uh, just the incredible uh, leaders and volunteers that we get to partner in ministry uh, with. You know, uh, this season, we're in a series now called Life Verses, and we've been challenging individuals and families to choose a life verse uh, during this season. And the life verse that we have chosen for our family comes from Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. You know, this last year was a difficult year for us. We experienced loss. It was uh, last April, uh, Sarah's mom passed away. And then just three months later in July, uh, my mom passed away. And uh, it was during uh, that season, I think we had to learn to trust in the Lord, even when it's hard, even uh, though there's pain and it doesn't make sense. Uh, we don't always understand it, uh, but we trust in the Lord and realize that He is in control. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 is our life verse. What's yours? All right, good stuff. Well, it's good to hear from Pastor Dave and Sarah. They're out at our Romeoville location. We're so thankful for them. I got a statistic I want to share with you. I read it this week. It's by Pew Research Group, and they said that 56% of Americans, they believe in the God as he's revealed in the Bible. Now think about that for a moment. That's actually, so a little over half, but as he's revealed in the Old Testament in the New, that's actually, I would have thought it would have been less, but my question is this, to those people, how many of them have experienced the God in the Bible? have experienced a divine encounter with him? How many would say that they know him, that they've experienced him in a unique way in their daily life? That's what I want to talk to you about. And that's what today's life verse is all about. If you're joining us online, we're thankful that you're with us today. If you're visiting us here in the seats, thankful for those in the balcony. We are in a series called Life Verses. And these are the kind of verses that you grab hold of and the promises and truths that you have, the Mount Rushmore kind of verses. And today's verse, it's critical because it has what I would call a spiritual equation in it to help us experience God more. That's what I've learned from these verses over the years. It's got an equation. Now, I'm not reducing God to some equation. Please do not send me an email. But I'm saying there's a spiritual formula, for lack of a better word, that can help us to experience the creator of the universe. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want. So what's the formula? Well, hold on, we'll get to it in a moment. Let's take a look at the verse from a variety of different translations. From the ESV, the one I teach from, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. Look at this next translation. With all your heart, you must trust the Lord and not your own judgment. Always let him lead you and he will clear the road for you to follow. How about this one from the Amplified Version? Trust and rely confidently on the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight or your understanding. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize him and he will make your path straight and smooth removing obstacles that block your way. And how about lastly, this is from the message. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. So here's the formula. Take a look at it with me. Trust in God minus reliance on self times acknowledgement of God equals intervention from God, divine intervention that we can experience him more in our lives. So let's take a look at each one of these components one at a time. First, we're talking about trusting in God. The verse says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, we're gonna do a deep dive on several of these words. Trust, in its Hebrew, it actually 
is used over 120 times in the Old Testament. Sometimes you'll see it translated confidence or bold or even secure. And what it literally means is that we're to take refuge in, we're to run quickly to the Lord. That's what it literally means, that we're going to take refuge in him. I like to think of trust in the Lord as belief in action. Now, the next word we see, trust in the Lord, anytime you see L-O-R-D in capitals, when you're reading your Bibles, just stop and pay attention because they're trying to communicate something that is pivotal for our faith. L-O-R-D, capital, small caps, in our English Bibles, it's in reference to the Hebrew term for God that is Yahweh. And that is the most personal and intimate name for God in all of Scripture. And it's almost like this. When you read that, you stop and take note because you're on a first name basis with God. That's how well he wants to know. He's not some distant God who doesn't want you to know him. He wants to be involved in your life. He wants to help you. That's why we're to run to him to place our trust in him. Some of you know I have two son-in-laws. And an interesting thing about my two son-in-laws is, and I've never said this, I've never said anything like this, but, but they don't call me by my first name, Ron. They call me Mr. Zappia. And so as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking that's what I used to call Jody's dad, Mr. Shoop. I mean, I would never call him Joe, but again, I never said, you can't call me that. I guess that's the aura I give. But seriously, I was talking to one of my son-in-laws the other day or this couple weeks ago, and I said, you know, what does my daughter call your parents? And he kind of didn't really answer and kind of skirted the question a bit. And I only asked it because I knew that she called them by their first names. And then finally I said, hey, listen, man, I said, it's okay if you want to call me since she calls your parents by their first names, you can call me by my first name. He hasn't done it yet. <laughs> Again, that must be the aura I give. But all seriousness, we can be on a first name basis with the creator of the universe. That God in heaven, we don't have to call him sir, we don't have to call him mister. Now I'm not saying be disrespectful to him for who he is. But think for a moment, on the majority of times in the scripture where we see God is called father. That's what he is to us, he is our heavenly father. And the apostle Paul even takes it one step further and says, along with Jesus, he calls him by the Aramaic. And it's simply Abba, which translates in our English language, daddy. Like that's how close God wants to be with you. He's our daddy. So I'm thinking that's what I might have my son-in-law call me. <laughs> daddy. Let's just vote right now if that's a good thing for my son-in-law to not use Mr. Not, Daddy. I, I kind of like that now that I'm thinking. But seriously, God wants to not only function, he is our dad as we submit ourselves to him. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. We're slowing down in these two verses to understand that all your heart is very significant because for the Israelite people, it meant this. It meant your mind your emotion, and your will. And so stop for a moment, and maybe you grew up in a traditional church background like I did. This can be very important teaching in this moment. It's not enough to believe intellectually and just to know and have intellectual consent to a doctrine or to a creed. No, the Israelites, they, they had intellectual consent in their mind, but also in their hearts and it resulted in belief in action and it changed who they were and what they did. So think of it like this, we'll put this on the board. We trust in God when we engage our minds intellectually with who he is. There's some truth that we gotta know about God in the Bible, what he says, and how he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for each of us, that's the gospel, that we need to embrace that. But then we also, we trust in God, we engage our minds intellectually with who he is, our hearts emotionally with what he does what God has done in the past, what God will do in the future, what God did on the cross with Jesus. If you haven't shed a tear for who Jesus is, then it hasn't engaged in what he did for you. Then I, I wonder if it's engaged your heart truly. And then with our wills, behaviorally, with what he wants us to do, that God 
has a plan and wants us to respond. Again, trust is belief in action. So that's what we learn here in the first part of this equation. Now let's take a look at what some others have said about trusting God. Augustine says it this way. Love this. Trust the past to God's mercy. Hey, I can't fix that. I can't do that. I'm just going to trust. And, and, and God, that's your mercy. Trust the present to God's love because he's your heavenly father who loves you. And trust the future to God's providence, to his provision, to his plan. How about this? Corey Ten Boom, and maybe some of you rec uh, recognize, I'm sure, that name. I mean, this is a woman who, during the Holocaust, she used her home as a refuge for many Jewish people that she literally saved them from death. She says, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God, a God we love and a God we trust. And, and then lastly, how about this one? I thought this was great. We trust as we love and where we love. If we love Christ much, surely we shall trust him much. Second part of the equation. This is a component that is the minus part. So this isn't the good thing. This is the minus reliance on self. And in the verse, it literally says that we're to not lean on our own understanding. Now, lean here, in its original language, it's used 22 times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew term. And sometimes you'll see it translated like we're talking about as rely, or sometimes it's translated as stand, or sometimes it's translated as like rest. And so we're not to rely on our own wisdom and insight. We're not to stand on our own wisdom and insight. We're not to lean on our own insight and knowledge. That no, that it's not our ingenuity that's gonna win the game for us. That what, that we've got to lean on God's insight and his understanding. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't trust other people or listen to them, but is it grounded in what God wants and what he says. Do not lean on your own understanding, but lean on God and his word. You say, well, why not? That's a pretty good question. I mean, why shouldn't we? Well, let me just, let's have a little bit of fun in church at 1141. Everybody up for a little fun? Okay. This is what it looks like when you rely on self. Look at this guy. That was not good. This is my favorite. Look at this guy going to get wasted right in the front, right there in the hat. And then this guy's thinking, ah, oh, let me just, this is a good idea. No, that wasn't a good idea. How about this one? We've all been here. Well, maybe not. And then this is my favorite. Check this out. Oh. What is wrong with you, Pastor? I just like kook slams. It's great on Instagram. You know, they just show you all this stuff people do and uh, all joking aside that what, that all of us have been in that position where, man, when we rely on just ourselves and our own understanding and it's not informed by God and his word and what he wants, man, we can crash pretty seriously. If you've been there, give me an alligator hand raise. It's like, I don't want to admit it, but the truth is that, that yeah, that when we rely on ourselves and our own ingenuity and our own insight, that things don't always go that, that great. And so, I often like to think of it like this, that to be self-sufficient is to be God-deficient. So let's look at what some others have said. D.L. Moody says it best. He says, when a man thinks he has got a good deal of strength and is self-confident, you may look for his downfall. It may be years before it comes to light, but it is already commenced, meaning it's already begun. I mean, that pride and that self-reliance and that self-righteousness. How about this next one? Self-sufficiency is the enemy of salvation. Boy, that's saying it pretty clear. If you're self-sufficient, you have no need of God. If you have no need of God, you do not seek him. If you do not seek him, you won't find him. And then lastly, the great mistake made by most of the Lord's people, that's you and me, is in hoping to discover in themselves that which is to be found in Christ alone. So let's recalibrate. Remember today that we're trying to experience God more. Well, we got to trust in God. we got to minus reliance on self and then multiply. Next part of the equation is that we would acknowledgement of God. Now this is, I don't want to say it's the most significant part of the equation, but it can be the most misunderstood. 
I did it as a multiplier because that's what it does. I grew up in a home where a uh, hardworking Midwestern family, and, and I'm telling you, my dad taught me when I graduated from college, and it was like I had a job in the business world, and he taught me this thing about compound interest. You say, what's compound interest? Well, it's where the interest works for you and it multiplies itself. And so yes, put your money into that IRA, Ron, and take advantage of every stock option they have for your retirement. And don't take anything out of it and that will build in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, and then there'll be a nest egg. And I'm like, yeah, right. It, it grows, it does. And it may not be this, but it's certainly this when it was this. And and it's a multiplier. And that's exactly what this does, is that if we want to multiply our experience with God, the divine encounters and revelation that we have from him and with him, it requires acknowledgement of him. So let's understand this term acknowledgement. That's what it's translated here in my version. It's used 946 times in the, New, in the Old Testament, this word this Hebrew word. And other times you'll see it as understood or as know or as declare. So we're to acknowledge by understanding, we're acknowledged by knowing, we're to acknowledge by declaring. I would suggest to you that the best translation of this or meaning is that it's acknowledging meant by surrendering and submitting that that's how we're to acknowledge God. It's not just a tip of the hat to God. If you want to experience him more, this is an essential part of the equation as it's the multiplier effect that we've got to surrender and submit to understand. We've got to surrender and submit to know. We've got to surrender and submit to declare him. So let's put that right in. The equation, in all your ways, surrender and submit to him and he will make straight your path. In all my ways? Yep, in all your ways. Hey, hey, can you be a little bit more specific? That's pretty general. Well, how about these handles? Let's just look no further than Proverbs chapter 3. Let's take a deep dive on the entire proverb and ask ourselves the question, what is Solomon? He's the writer, and what he's doing is he's writing to his son to help him experience God more, and he wants that to happen for him. He's talking about wisdom, he's trying to give him wisdom. Hey, don't pay the stupid tax like I did. And, and he's saying the same thing to us. And so what specifically are we to surrender and submit to him about? Well, let's take a look at verses one through four. We need to surrender and submit ourselves to biblical teaching. That's what you're doing here. I, I love the fact that as a church, what are we doing? We lean into what the scriptures say. And, and that's what Solomon was talking about. He said, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So there's the benefit. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you'll find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So biblical teaching, I need to surrender and submit to it. How about this next one, verses seven and eight? We need to surrender and submit ourselves to holiness and godly living. Now, it's interesting that after these life verses, the first thing that he goes to, be not wise in your own eyes. So, man, you're not always seeing things clearly. Again, there's the self-sufficiency. He says, fear the Lord, proper respect for God, and there it is, turn away from evil, that you would be holy, that you would be like God, that you would be like his son. Why would I want to do that? Well, it, there's gonna, it's going to bring healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. What else do we need to submit and surrender to? Well, we need to submit and surrender ourselves to generosity. And we've been talking a lot about that here at High Point, that we want to be generous with our time and with our talents and with our testimony, with our treasure, that, that man, we want to be generous as we live the Christian life. And he's talking specifically here about our treasure. As Solomon writes, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. So what he's saying here is he's saying, hey man, don't give God your second best. Don't give him your leftover. God's not into leftover meat, uh, pizza or meatloaf in the fridge. He wants the first cut. Well, why would I do that? Well, then he says, your barns will be filled with plenty, which I find that interesting, and your vats will be bursting with wine. Hmm. 
I don't have a barn, but I'm kind of interested in this wine thing. I don't know about you. But what's the picture? The picture is of blessing. And I've said it on this stage hundreds of times over the years that, that you can't outgive God. Man, you give him your first, you give him your best, whether it's your time, your talents. Here he's talking about treasure. And man, God's going to bless you and do things that you couldn't. You can't outgive him. What else does Solomon say? Well, we need to surrender and submit ourselves to the Lord's discipline. Uh, the audience just got quiet. Well, what do you mean discipline? Well, that's what Solomon's getting at. For each of us, he says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. So he's talking about the fact that, hey, man, you're going to do some things wrong. And God's going to correct you. And God's going to provide healing for you. Look what he says. The Lord reproves him who he loves. And is the father, the son in whom he delights. So God's discipline is something that we should welcome as we do what? As we don't do the things that he desires, that, that we would repent and that we would look to be restored. And, and these are the things that what? That, that we need to surrender and submit to. What's the last one? Well, in verses 13 through 18, it talks about submitting and surrendering ourselves to God's wisdom. And that's a theme in the Proverbs that Solomon writes about. He says, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding for the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. So he's comparing wisdom. It's using it as her. She, this wisdom, she's more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand, her riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold fast are called blessed. So take a look at this list. We're talking about acknowledging God in all our ways. And I don't know about you, but I look at a list like that and I think, man, that's not an easy task right there. That's why we need each other. That we're to walk arm in arm and hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder and back to back. That's the picture of Christian community as we do what? As we seek to surrender and submit ourselves to these things. That's why we have growth groups and we have hope groups that these are opportunities not just to gather on the weekend, but to gather in groups across people's homes and even here at the church, smaller groups where we can learn and grow together to share each other's experience. Pastor Craig has said it already, but let me say it like this, calling all men. I'm asking that we would lead out in 2022 as we acknowledge God in all our ways. And we would come together. That's what we're doing on Saturday morning right here next Saturday. You say, I thought that, is that the men's conference we do each year? We didn't get to do it last year? Yeah, kind of, except there's going to be no hammer throw like we normally do in here, and people aren't going to be scaling up to the ceiling, and we're not shooting any guns off like we normally do. How come? Because we just felt like in this season of isolation and where we've been apart so long, we just want to get together to talk and have conversation and learn and link arms. And I want to challenge us. Let's, let's lead together. Some of you know that I teach at our Wheaton location, and I just returned from there teaching at their 10 o'clock service, and I come right here now to teach in this service. And on my way out this morning, a young guy came up to me, and he just said, he said, hey, hey, what would you, what would you say, how would you describe a high-point man? I found that was interesting, and I stopped, and I looked at my watch, and I thought, I'm going to be late. And I just said, come next Saturday, and I'll answer that question for you. But in all seriousness, that's a great question. And we've lost a sense of biblical manhood. And, and what we want to do is gather together as guys. We've got Derwin Gray. Again, Pastor Craig has already said this. He's become a friend of ours here at High Point, uh, NFL player who's turned pastor. And he's got something to help us understand what it looks like for true biblical manhood. And it may surprise you. I think at times we think of something that it's not. And, so let's take the lead as we trust in the Lord with all our hearts, man. Let's take the lead as we do not lean on our own understanding. Let's take the lead for a few hours next Saturday as, as we simply do this. Let's acknowledge God in all our ways. And then he'll make our path straight. 
And that's the last part. That's the reward. That's the equals. That's the intervention. That's, that's what this whole thing is about, that, that I can experience more of God in my daily life. Divine intervention. And again, let's do one more deep dive on the words in the text. And he says that you'll do what? That he will make your paths straight. And so this word translated for us, make straight, it's used 27 times in the Hebrew scriptures. It, in other places, we'll see it, he'll direct your paths. He'll please, he'll meet. It's an interesting concept. It literally means that he's going to make smooth your paths, that he's going to straighten it out, that, that he's going to get you back on track. That's what we saw in the other versions. He's going to understand this. He's going to clear the road, man. He's going to remove the obstacles from blocking away. He's going to keep you on the road. Interestingly, if you think of it this way, it's like we're traveling and, man, there's some obstacles and God's going to straighten your path to get you where he wants you to go. This past week, I was driving down Orchard Road to get here and all of a sudden, I'm hitting the gas and I'm hitting the gas and I'm not going anywhere and there's cars passing me and I got it full to the floor and it's not going anywhere and I finally get off to the side of the road and I'm thinking, man, this thing's got 125,000 miles on it, but I thought it was good. And I, it, it just, it refused to go forward. But as I was hitting the gas, it just, it just revved and revved and revved. So I trusted in the Lord. I did not lie on my own understanding because I know nothing about cars. And I called my wife, Jody. <laughs> I didn't even get out of the car. I didn't even put the hood up because I don't want to get embarrassed. And I just sat there in the car and just waited and said all that to say that sometimes we get stuck, man. And we're trying to rev the engines and it's not engaging. And whether it's an obstacle in your path, whether it's you, <laughs> I mean, you run out of energy or fuel ahead in this time, or whether it's not engaging properly, man, God wants to get you where you're going. He wants to straighten the path. I mean, that's what this is teaching. Now, interestingly, maybe you've heard the people say it like this. They say that what God does is God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. Anybody ever heard that? I mean, it's a great line, you know. It's like, yeah, he does that. But here we see what God wants to do is he wants to straighten the path of the broken stick. And that's what this does. I mean, we can experience him more. Let me close our service today with some real life stories as we focus on this equation. I got some people right here on our staff who are doing this equation. They're experiencing God more. First, I want to highlight Carly Capuana and Callum Shaw and Carly and Callum. Callum came 10 years ago to our church. It's hard to believe. It's been 10 years. He came over from Scotland to be an intern here. And then Carly, she came over as far as Rochester, New York to be an intern here. Now, for those who are geographically challenged, he actually came farther. But they met. And awesome, man, they started dating. And then they fell in love. And then they got married. And we got a wedding picture of Callum here. Here he is right here in his skirt. He's Scottish all the way to the core. He's got the kilt going on. And, and then they had kids. And we're so thankful for Carly and Callum and how they've used their gifts and their talents to bless us over the years at all of our locations. And Callum is often leads here. But God's been directing him and leading him. And in this next season, they're sensing that they want to be closer to family uh, specifically to Carly's family in Rochester. So they're going to be moving in the next month and we're going to see them for the next, next week and celebrate that and over the next month that, that what, if you get a chance to say thank you and, and praise God for their faithfulness and commitment. Can we praise God for their commitment here and leading us in worship? And so um, the thing that I love about this though is, man, they want to experience God more and they're experiencing him as he's leading them in this new path. And second, we've got Marty and Anna Rowan. And Marty and Anna, Marty leads, Pastor Marty leads our uh, kids and family ministries here and um, 
high school and student ministries, and they had a child, and what was interesting was that they wanted to have another child, but unfortunately, I mean, tragedy struck, and they met with a doctor, and the doctor said because of Anna's growth in her brain that they weren't going to be able to have any more children. And so they had already, catch this, they had already thought about adopting. They wanted to adopt. They had gotten the process going. So the week that she finds out that they can't have any of their own biological kids, I mean, how tragic is that? They also found out that there was a kid in Arizona that was going to be born in several months that they could adopt. And that same week, they also found out, catch this, she was pregnant. I mean, think about that. The doctor said no, God said yes, amen? And, and honestly, what an awesome thing. Now, it didn't work out as they traveled, and can you imagine they praying and asking God for his wisdom and guidance, and, and they made it all the way out to Arizona and only to have the mother um, say, I want to keep the baby. But they're still committed to adoption. I'm so thankful for that. But then this past December, they had... Uh, baby Nova. So they had their, another baby girl. And so what I love about Marty and his wife, Anna, is that, man, they're just trusting in the Lord. They're not relying on their own understanding. They're doing what? They're, they're acknowledging him in all their ways. And he's making straight the path. And then lastly, this is a story that hits close to home right here in Naperville. It's Pastor Craig and his wife, Camille. And so thankful for the Steiners and their leadership here. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on Jonathan. And um, although Hannah's playing today and she's walking up right now, let's give Hannah a round of applause. That's Craig's youngest daughter. And so, or only daughter, I should say. And, and she's, going to get, she's going to get me going. She's, you're trying to play me off the stage and I'm talking about you. But, um, you know, we laugh and it's just so great to link arms as families and and together, but um, unfortunately, what wound up happening is Jonathan, when Craig and Camille were taking him home from college, and I mean, he's 20 years old, and, and they find out, they get home through a normal routine physical, they found out he's got cancer. And so I mean, the devastation of a young kid with everything out in front of him and his whole life, and, and I can't think of the, 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 the feelings and thoughts with Craig and Camille, and that, man, they're pressing in the Lord. Lord, you gotta show up, man. We gotta experience you. We want your comfort. We want your healing, and and all those prayers, and fortunately, I'm here to say that, thankfully, that Jonathan had the procedures that were necessary in the surgery and followed the path, and, and, and he's been cleared, which is awesome. Can we praise God? But, but as, as we clap, I, I know we can praise God for the present, but we know, and, and, and if you're a cancer patient or have someone in your family, there's always that thought, is it going to come back, and it's, are we out of this? And, and he has all that in front of him, and Thankfully, the tests are all negative, but, but he's trusting in God. So much so that um, we'll show a picture of his tattoo, and he got a tattoo. That's the Hebrew um, on his arm, and it's the Hebrew word preserve. Isn't that awesome? Because he's like, man, God preserved me. And he says it like this. He says, my test has become my testimony. That God showed up, and he, and he experienced him to a greater degree. And so I'm going to ask you to join me in praying for Pastor Craig as I think the Lord's leading him to get the same tattoo on his arm. <laughs> but he has not responded yet. And, but in all seriousness, what a great testimony, man. 20-year-old kid like this, yep, God did it, man. Don't miss it. I, these are families, real people, real stories of people in our church who are just trusting God and not leaning on their own understanding. And in all their ways, man, the best they can, much more than the tip of the hat, they're acknowledging him and who he is and what he's done and what he's about by surrendering and submitting themselves. And, and God, in his infinite wisdom, they're experiencing him clearing the path, removing the obstacles, getting him going again with new energy and new strength and, and new passion and new commitment. Am I saying that all problems are gone and there's never another difficulty and there's never another the road? No, but the God who we love and we serve and we trust and we follow, he will remove the paths. Amen? As we lean into him. And so, Father, I thank you for an equation, a spiritual equation in our Bibles that helps us to not only know you, Lord, and know about you, but to experience you. And, Lord, as we get ready to worship you, I think of each of us, whether we're here in person or online, 
Lord, some of us are in need of direction, divine direction. And there's a decision that we have in front of us that, that we need to move forward. And maybe it's about a career. Or maybe it's about a, starting a family. And maybe the truth is that you want to, but you've been told you can't. And there's some obstacles. And, or maybe there's a diagnosis that you didn't see coming. Father, we want to experience more of your presence as we trust in you, as we acknowledge you. And I pray now that you would help us to lean in to you, Lord, that we would rely on you, that we would look to you. And we acknowledge in this moment, Lord, that we need you. We need more of you. So would you reveal to yourself to us? Could we even get a special touch from you now as we worship and song and declare from our lips that, that, Lord, we cannot do it on our own, in our own strength, and our own power, but we need you, Lord, to provide the leading. We need you, Lord, to provide the comfort. We need you, Lord, to lead us, I pray. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. Let's stand to our feet and worship him.